it's great to see you here. This is the first time we do it uh, around lunchtime, so there's a bit of a, uh, I feel like I'm <laughs> in a different space. Um, our talks are usually are at five o'clock. Um, there's a bit of a, uh, if you've been to one of the Oxy talks in the past, there's a bit of a, a, a difference both in time and uh, in the time that we have and uh, the stuff that we're gonna go uh, through. Uh, first, instead of having uh, a full hour, uh, we're gonna have uh, uh, 45 minutes uh, for the talk, and then we only have about 15 minutes for questions. However, uh, because we know that there's classes after this, because it's in the middle of the day, but uh, if there is more interest for more questions, we have the room for later, so we, we, can, we can go an extra 15 minutes. Um, uh, I, I'm the director of the uh, Ottoman Turkish Studies, um, and uh, I'm only this year. <laughs> so I'm, I just uh, came up from New York and I'm a bit uh, disoriented, so forgive me. Um, it is the first talk for uh, OTC, but it's definitely not the last one for this year. Um, before I introduce Sinan Chitti, uh, I want to tell you really quickly about a couple of things that are coming up very soon. Uh, the first is a collaboration with the law school and uh, medical school. We all have been working very hard to put together a, a two-day conference uh, on uh, uh, the refugee crisis in, in the Middle East. Um, uh, we're focusing mostly on Syrian and Iraqi refugees, and uh, we have experts coming from literally all over the world. Um, uh, a, a huge focus would be, of course, on the refugees in Turkey, uh, so we have a lot of people coming from Turkey specifically for this, but also Jordan and Lebanon, where most of the refugees are, as you know. We hear a lot about, of course, Europe, but uh, Europe has a fraction of what Turkey has, for instance. Um, uh, so this is, uh, the, the focus is gonna be on education, and, uh, for uh, the education and uh, training for refugees that, uh, in their host countries. So it's called Beyond Survival. Uh, uh, the website will go live in a couple of days, so keep your eyes and ears open. It's open to the public, uh, and it will go it's from November 6th to 8th. Um, uh, the, uh, and we also have uh, the theme this year for OC is going to be Law in the Ottoman Empire. This is a, a, a slight uh, diversion, uh, uh, and most of the speakers though, are going to be in, in. Is it really? Is there law involved? Yes. Yes. No. Well, the absence of law. The absence of law. That, that works. Um, so law, and because we're again partnering with the law school, and uh, the talks are going to happen mostly in the spring term or <laughs> spring term in the winter term, really. Um, and uh, uh, we'll, you'll hear a lot more about this uh, later. But for now, uh, I would like to introduce our guest today, uh, Dr. Sinan Jiddi. Uh, Dr. Sam Chitti is uh, the um, executive director of the Institute of Turkish Studies. Uh, 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 Dr. Chitti got his uh, uh, PhD in political science from the School of uh, Oriental and African Studies, uh, the University of London. Um, he uh, was an instructor at uh, Sabanji University, and uh, um, then uh, he just recently, well, recently he published a book it's, uh, about five years now. It's just as recently on here, so it's like, yeah, we should do that. It's uh, on Kemalism in uh, Turkish politics, the Republican uh, People's Party, secularism and nationalism. Uh, we are really, really happy that Sinan could actually make the time to come and tell, uh, talk to us about what's happening currently in Turkey. He, as you can imagine, is incredibly busy because of uh, what's taking on, both in terms of what's happening in Turkey, both in terms of the elections, post-election chaos, and of course, most, most recently, the horrific events taking place uh, um, in, in, in Ankara. Uh, so we, uh, we needed uh, some clarity and, and to shed some light on, on this to the Cornell community and hopefully wider. We're gonna put this up on, online to try and get a, a handle on what's actually taking place in Turkey right now um, from a political point of standpoint. Uh, I'm not, I'm going to keep it this short, and uh, please help me welcome Dr. Sinan Jitki. Thank you very much for having me. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, my friend and colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Manawi, thank you so much for taking the time out of your own calendar and your own schedule, particularly since you're on leave. I don't know if I would do the same for you, but 
if I was on leave, but it, it, thank you so much for having me to. <laughs> um, but um, no, it is a great pleasure to be back at Cornell. I was back uh, here a few years ago. I'm told it was three years ago, but th that seems a very long time ago. But uh, it is extremely um, uh, poignant, and, 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 uh, and I appreciate all departments and centers and individuals who have made this possible. It is, uh, thank you for your time, thank you for your contributions. Um, I know these things ti take time to organize, and um, so I do very much appreciate it. Um, I think, as, as, as this talk is titled, what we're accustomed to uh, when we look at the case about the Islamic State and the fight against the Islamic State as it has continued up until now, has understandably been very much uh, perceived and looked at from the American perspective, mainly because we are here and we are accustomed to following the news, we are accustomed to seeing uh, broadcast and print media, looking at it from a particular perspective, which is how the United States looks at it, what are the questions in, uh, that arise as far as involvement of the United States, possibly its partners, and sometimes to a certain extent, we do get it from the perspective of you know, what is Turkey doing. Um, so what I'm gonna hopefully try and do today in the time that it's allotted to me is look at it as very much from a regional but a specific country perspective, uh, and that is namely the perspective of Turkey. Um, and Turkey, I guess, is no means the sole actor in this. It likes to broadcast for a variety of reasons that it is hosting more refugees uh, than it can possibly uh, uh, endure, um, probably a pro a pro uh, uh, coming to close to um, 3 million now, 2.5 million is somewhat of an outdated figure. Uh, but it's also the only NATO country in the region which presents unique problems and challenges for <coughs> Turkey as well as its partners and allies uh, in what we do about the Islamic State uh, in the near future. Um, but it is very much an issue uh, that is going to be looked at from my perspective uh, as a regional issue from the lenses of Turkey, uh, Turkey's own motivations for now deciding, when I say now, uh, since probably uh, June, July this year, its reasons and motivations for really deciding to engage in the Islamic State, against the Islamic State, and what are Turkey's motivations for this? Uh, I will save you the suspense in a little while. I'm not going to leave it right until the end. But before I do that, the reason why I'm asking what are Turkey, mo Turkey's motivations and reasons for looking at this, it's because if you look at policy analysts, if you look at journalists who've been in Turkey and seen what Turkey is doing, it is very much perceived to be uh, a less than benign and a less than this is what allies do for each other type of approach to why Turkey is now deciding to come into the fight against Islamic State. It has even led some analysts to question Turkey's credentials as a NATO member, even asking the question, does Turkey actually belong in NATO still? Uh, that is a very tough question that has been put forward, um, and it is very much angering and upsetting uh, the Turkish government, uh, who would like to continue pre uh, presenting themselves as a vital component of the Western alliance. Um, the threat of the Islamic State by itself, though, before we launch into Turkey, is, by, is it very much in itself the greatest threat, I think, it is fair to say, that has engulfed the region, the Middle East, Near East and Middle East, um, if not more, in more than a generation. Uh, some argue since the end of World War II, uh, if, the, if, the, if it can be taken that, uh, that far back. There is no clear course of action as to how this will be resolved. There is no grand plan strategy that has been agreed upon, implemented by uh, by powers such as the United States, such as Russia, uh, even re regional powers such as Iran and Israel and Turkey, there is a quagmire of opinions about what should be done, but less so uh, in terms of a roadmap that has been put forward. There is a lot of heated discussion, and this is critical that, uh, to the longevity, the stability of the region uh, from a great many perspectives, which is, which is very disconcerting and very, very alarming for a great many number of people situated in uh, the government of the United States, the military of the United States, NATO powers uh, in Brussels, as well as the European Union. From a very human perspective, you know, if you ask, well, why is this the biggest threat to engulf the region and, and possibly w collective peace and security? Um, Mustafa alluded to this just initially in his talk. I mean, we're, you, it seems that there will be a, a, a conference hopefully on the issue here. This is the biggest displacement of people that we have seen since World War II. 
Two and a half million or three million refugees in a country such as Turkey, it's not a refugee problem. It's a minority issue. Uh, the European Union, with its Schengen Agreement, cross-border flows of people and goods and services, does not have a framework with which to deal with such a massive displacement of people, uh, leading some countries even to actually abrogate the Schengen Agreement for temporarily. What is the future uh, of this population displacement and what is going to be done about it? There is a very human element about this that hasn't been addressed, possibly cannot be addressed within the current rubric and framework of European institutions. Um, but from a more realist perspective, if you want to look at it from that, from that angle, as in real issues that concern great power plays, um, it is, I think, to some extent unfairly leveled at the United States, saying that the US is only interested in this part of the world, historically, even contemporarily, because it wants to secure oil and therefore the security of the Middle East and stable energy supplies and stable energy prices, it's all it cares about. I think that's somewhat of a gross exaggeration simply because uh, this region does supply a considerable amount of oil to the United States, but the United States does obtain the largest supply of foreign oil from its immediate neighbor, Canada. Uh, but it is interested in maintaining territorial stability, sovereignty of existing regimes as much as it can, more, for the more from the perspective of ensuring stable energy flows and energy security and prices to European countries. <coughs> the European Union being one of the most important, if not the most important, uh, trading partner of the United States. That is a very real perspective as to why the US should be involved in that. And if you look at the map of how internally divided Syria is right now, with not necessarily just the challenge posed by the Islamic State, but the possible collapse of the Assad regime, uh, independent uh, townships for coming together and forming a possible Kurdish entity in northern Syria, um, Islamic uh, State, as, as, as I've already mentioned, um, other less than savory groups such as Jabhat al-Nusra roaming around, the territorial integrity of Syria, if compromised, presents a significant number of problems for great numbers of powers, not least of all Turkey, not least of all the United States, but Iraq, Israel, uh, and Turkey. So this is a problem, this is an issue that is not going to go away. It's not going to be ignored by the media, such as the Ukraine, which has now dropped off the radar, seemingly. Um, it is here to stay, as, and according to some analyst opinion, if nothing is done about it, or even if it's something is done about it, militarily, diplomatically, <coughs> that it will stay around for at least 10 years, if not more. So this does present key problems in terms of what is the responsibility and role for international organizations and institutions such as the UN, military alliances such as NATO, and great powers such as uh, the Russian Federation and the United States, who have different interests and outcome hopeful uh, hopes for this uh, ensuing conflict. This map is slightly out of date in terms of uh, territorial grabs and you know the present state of Islamic State, etc. But the intention of this was to really draw your attention to looking at the dissolution of uh, uh, of territorial integrity. These borders of Syria, along with Iraq, are seemingly very porous and very transparent at this moment. There is no effective. Um, uh, boundary uh, patrol. Um, that being said, there has been a considerable amount of international pressure, I think, ex an expectation, I should say, that this is a problem which the United States should spearhead. The, the time-old question of what is the US going to do about this? It's seen as an interventionist power in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in the Balkans, historically. Uh, it was a participant in uh, the Arab Spring revolutions, most, most notably NATO operations against Libya and the Qaddafi regime. So it possibly might be natural that it follows on, given the state of the risks at, uh, at present, what is the US going to do about this? Um, you may say that's an unfair question and uh, an expectation. I'm not going to go into that. But if we were to try and answer it very basically, and this is where Turkey then comes into it, the US approach up until now, along with its partners, its coalition partners, has been essentially two-pronged. 
One, it's conducted a number of airstrikes. And these are still going on. And since the ascendancy of the Islamic State, uh, really capturing a lot of territory in Syria, what we have seen is airstrikes emanating out of US carriers in the Persian Gulf and also um, uh, air bases out of Iraq. The problem is this uh, Islamic State is located in northern Syria. Fighters taken off uh, from here and here to get to here. This presents a huge logistical problem in terms of fuel spent. The bombing effectiveness against IS targets is extremely limited or has been extremely limited to the extent that it has resulted in the prevention of further significant advancement of is Islamic State forces and territorial capture. It hasn't driven it back to a large extent. It hasn't resulted in catastrophic losses for the Islamic State. And it certainly, which is probably the most important thing, hasn't dwindled their resolve to continue fighting and grabbing territory out of uh, 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 Syria and Iraq. So this is a hands-off policy. It's a containment policy. It's a limited policy. Uh, and it's a costly policy, which few other po uh, powers outside of the US can afford to continue. The other thing that the United States has been uh, significantly engaged in is uh, a, a, a policy of uh, arming, providing logistical support, military assistance, and training of what, we have been what has been referred to as vetted rebels. Now, the problem with vetted rebels is, A, they are very few in number. The vetting process takes a considerable amount of time. Um, they take a long time to do get trained. Okay? And we don't necessarily have the luxury of uh, waiting to vet these uh, a number of individuals to take the fight to Islamic State, which can actually swell their ranks, or which have swelled in their ranks, much more significantly in the last two years. Okay? So it's logistical support to armed fighters. And outside of the vetting process, these weapons and assistance and military training has been extended to Kurdish fighting groups, notably known as the PYD which I'll t uh, in northern Syria, which I'll tell, um, uh, touch upon a little more in, in due course. Why has Washington been reluctant to get involved in this? Um, historically, when I say historically, three years ago, when this problem really did surface and become a very much of a problem issue, uh, threatening the security um, issues that I've um, raised. It was the midterm and presidential elections and a public opinion in this country which is not ready or accepting or welcoming of another quote-unquote foreign war was not something that the Obama administration wanted to take to the public. And trepidation and reluctance and reticence to get involved in Syria against the Islamic State by Obama has been something that has been very frustrating to many circles but it's, I, I, would, I would suggest that it's understandable, uh, given that you want to continue your political administration. Um, and the second one is probably predicated upon, second reason, very much predicated upon very hard lessons learned from experiences by the United States military in Afghanistan and Iraq. The president announced today that uh, American troops would be will be remaining in Afghanistan beyond his term. Uh, and these are hard lessons mainly because what constitutes a US mission mandate in Syria. If you look at this road, if th this sort of landscape, even if it is slightly inaccurate in terms of territories, a more boots on the ground oriented policy, a much more invasive, uh, hardline policy of actually putting you, committing US troops on the ground uh, beyond public opinion, US public opinion, what would constitute success in Syria? Would it be the defeat, the military defeat and eradication of Islamic State? And is that possible? They're not exactly wearing t-shirts out there. Okay. Once that is done, what is our commitment and mandate with regards to the Assad regime? What is likely to be the uh, position of other opposition groups uh, like Jabhat al-Nusra, which is a local Al-Qaeda affiliate? Will we get shot at by them? How many troops will it take? What will be the loss of life and what will it cost? There is, it's an open-ended mission in much the way, same way that Iraq and Afghanistan was. And this is a position that the mili US military is giving uh, advice to, to the presidential uh, briefing, I would assume, saying, okay, it can be done, something can be done, but what is a good outcome of this? We cannot give you. Okay, so it's not a rosy picture in terms of um, 
what can and what should be done. But nevertheless, this is what it, uh, how it's um, opened up to be up until recently. What has been a significant game changer, it is thought, is the entry of Turkey into this. Turkey, as of this summer, just gone, has announced that it is taking an active stance against the Islamic State, that it will cooperate, and if necessary, in some capacity, join the fight against the Islamic State, mainly because uh, the immediate catalyst for that was Turkey itself was bombed by the Islamic State in June of this year. If I'm correct, was it June this year? Yeah. July, I'm sorry. It was just the Surich bombing of, uh, uh, of July, which can be seen here. The graphics aren't so good, I'm afraid, I'm sorry. Basically, uh, a suicide bomb essentially let loose in the middle of this town in where students were meeting, left wing uh, groups of, uh, group of students were meeting, killed just over 30 people, I think and it was um, owned up to by, uh, by the Islamic State, which basically showed that the Islamic State was no longer satisfied with its gains or its foothold in Syria and Iraq possibly, that it was now gonna take the fight to Turkey. And one of the main reasons for that is there are a considerable number of Turkish citizens who are members of the Islamic State, who have joined the ranks of the Islamic State. It's not an insignificant number. Some people are saying 20%. Some people say even as much as a third. Um, we have no way of knowing until people are captured and identified. But it is not an insignificant number. So this is something that to, watch so to watch out for. So Turkey, on the surface, has said that we are taking an active stance in this. And why is it a game changer? It's because of something like this. This is Injerlik Air Base which was a United States uh, leased base for limited number of operations, mainly limited to NATO missions, which Turkey had been uh, keeping closed for US missions against Islamic State, up until the bombings. This is a game changer from a military perspective, mainly because of what I showed you uh, in the first map up here. It significantly reduces the time and significantly increases the number of fighter sorties that can take off and maintain a continuous state of bombing against the Islamic State targets on a relatively frequent basis. Okay? It's less than 100 miles to Islamic State targets. It's highly effective. And the US had been gunning for this, asking for this, for a long, long time, and Turkey had been saying no for an official reason, which I don't think is the real reason, for the official reason that if we do join the fight, is this going to be something that we're just going to do? Or is there, a, is there a strategy which involves a coalition of partners? We don't want to get into this ourselves, but I don't think that's the real reason. Okay. So on the surface, it seems that Turkey's president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, who has been in power in one shape or form since 2003, has really sort of stepped up and said, Turkey is now joining the mission. This is the message that has played out on the international media. This is the message that uh, proponents of Turkey and advocates of Turkey would like to hear. And every day you watch CNN or the BBC or whatever, it's saying, what, are Turkish, what is Turkey doing for this? What is Turkey doing for that? It also allows logistical supplies to be airlifted out of Turkey and dropped uh, to uh, rebel fighter camps so they can be resupplied. It also allows rebel fighters to now come into Turkey and be treated and have a safe haven when required. So again, there is, the way this plays out, on paper it seems, there was a good motivation for Turkey to come into the fight now. It's being perceived as, as, as on, on the whole, as a credible reason for joining the fight. But what is, or what are, what I think to be the real motivations or the not necessarily behind the scenes because it's now coming out more and more in, in the press and in, 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 in analytical reports, analysis reports. It seems that Turkey's motivations for joining the fight against Islamic State are less than benign and less than uh, supportive of the real reasons for uh, taking the fight to these, uh, for, for, for altruistic reasons, if you, if you want to put it there. And there are, I think, two broad reasons which I would like to outline here 
Um, so this is where I save you the mystery. You don't have to wait till the end of this. I'll give them now and elaborate on them, hopefully. And, and let's see where, where, where it takes us. The first reason, I think, that Turkey is, has decided uh, to take the fight to the Islamic State as opposed to not getting involved is a flip-flop policy on the part of the Tayyip Erdogan regime, the AKP-led regime, which had initially, which it had initially supported, abetted and aided. Turkey, since about 2012, had the active military, logistical and political support of Turkey and the Islamic State was very much helped out for a considerable amount of here, a time. And there is strong evidence, documentary, visual, and media evidence, suggesting that Turkey had not only turned a blind eye to Islamic State activities in Syria, because it was interested in toppling, by any means necessary, in any way possible, the Bashar al-Assad regime. That's the first reason. It's a complete flip-flop policy right now. The second reason that I would like to argue, uh, which gets a bit of uh, opposition by some colleagues, I think, I think for Turkey, the Islamic State approach, its approach to taking on the Islamic State as an international issue, is very much rooted as a domestic polit political issue in order to strengthen and augment the political power base of Recep Tayyip Erdogan as president. It is very much a wag the dog type of policy. The closest that I can give you as an example, it doesn't quite really match, but it gives you some idea. Back in 2004, the presidential elections here, the message put out by the W. Bush regime was, if you vote for the other guy, we cannot guarantee the, the safety of American lives should there be another type of 9-11 attack. Tayyip Erdogan has said, unless you help me assume a presidency, but with augmented powers which have yet to come into existence in Turkey, then I cannot guarantee your safety against the Islamic State or any other separatist movement, the Kurdish rebellion now, that has flared up again, I need you to vote for me so that my powers as president can be increased and I can take a firm control of this. Those are the two reasons which I hope to um, augment before handing over the floor for questions. Going back to the first, this is a very sort of interesting um, conundrum. Turkey, if you're not familiar with Turkey's uh, sort of uh, foreign policy engagements, um, historical sort of ties to the Middle East is something, uh, engaged in something, a policy opening which it hitherto had not. And that is a broad and positive engagement with the Middle East beginning in the mid 2000s, which was absent in Turkey's foreign policy composition up until this point. Turkey, at best, up until the mid 2000s, rarely cared about the internal dynamics of the Middle East was not a significant trader part trading partner of any Middle East countries with the exception of energy, oil, and at worst, almost came to war with countries such as Syria in the late 1990s and had quite acrimonious relations with considerable number of Arab regimes. But it was this regime, the Tayyip Erdogan-led Justice and Development Party, or AKP regime in Turkey, which said, maybe we need to think about it differently, this differently. Why put all our eggs in one basket in the sense that why should Turkey just maintain its political uh, persuasions and aspirations with only joining the European Union, maintaining Europe as our trading partner, our biggest trading partner? What about the Middle East? What about opening up our businesses, especially our manufacturing, uh, labor-intensive, um, economic potential, which doesn't find buyers significant in Europe anymore, to Middle Eastern markets and North African markets, 
which are hungry for this. So there was a very much of a trading state, mercantile, instrumental reason that Tayyip Erdogan thought we need to open up to the Middle East and it was a sensible policy, I think. Turkey's share of trade with the Middle East jumped from about 8% in 2005 and up until recently had risen to about 22 to 23% of its overall trade, global trade. Significant increase and really uh, filling the coffers of Turkey uh, uh, and really providing a, new a significant number of new jobs to manufacturing hubs, Anatolian Tiger cities such as Kayseri, Denizli, Gaziantep, you name it, a lot of these cities. A second reason why Turkey really very much wanted to become involved in the Middle East under Tayyip Erdogan's tutelage was more of a sort of aspirational regional power perspective which had not really been put out before. Turkey as a rising power economically wanted to flex I think it's muscle and really put out its name as the contending regional power. And it had a lot of things to support that aspiration. Turkey is a NATO power. It's possibly the richest power in the region, military most capable, and very much was interested in playing the card of what Mr. Davutoglu, the architect of engagement with the Middle East, or it's the AKP's foreign policy, referred to as the creation of a zone of economic interdependence, saying that Turkey had the historical precedent, it had uh, the experience, the religious and cultural affiliation with the region of helping to get rid of this conflict-ridden zone and the, com the region's conflicts. They posited that if Turkey could begin positively engaging with individual countries of the, of the Arab Peninsula or the MENA region writ large, then that would also possibly result in these countries starting to work their differences out together because according to him, this may be as a result of the economy trumping all. If Turkey can trade with Syria and Saudi Arabia on an extend extended basis and in large basis, maybe the Syrians and Israelis can do the same. And if you laugh at that, I would hold your horses for one minute. Turkey almost successfully negotiated a peace treaty between Israel and Syria back in 2007. And the reason it failed was not because of Turkey, but because Netanyahu, uh, sorry, the, yes, Netanyahu went and bombed uh, uh, Gaza Strip. So this synergy of positively engaging with the Middle East was a golden age for Turkish expansionism, ideologically, mercantilly, uh, into this part of the world which had hitherto neglected. Okay. Now where this all goes wrong or south is not necessarily something that was uniquely created by Turkey but how Turkey has chosen to engage with this subsequently. And those are the Arab uprisings. And uh, to, be, to Turkey and Erdogan's credit, Turkey is not the only country that, doesn't, that didn't have or doesn't have a clear policy of how to engage with the Arab uprisings. The United States has had positive and engaged relations with half a dozen dictators for the better part of the Cold War, even beyond that. And Turkey did the same. Turkey worked out its differences with the Assads. It worked out its differences with Gaddafi. It worked out its differences with uh, yes, uh, uh, Mubarak. The problem is, and I will focus in on Syria, when the Syrian uprisings began, Turkey was the last country to implore the Assad regime. Erdogan said, give me one more chance, or number of chances. He will listen to me, because we have spent the last seven years, or more, working out our differences. I know this man, he's not going to follow through with this. The Assads ensured that they would listen to Turkey, stop killing their people, engage in a transition regime, work with the Euro uh, global powers and institutions, to oversee uh, a regime change in Syria possibly, but certainly stop the killing. Now the reason why Erdogan and the Turkish regime has been such a vociferous opponent of the Assad regime since then and has been interested, to put it mildly, in toppling the Assad regime is for one reason only. It's not strategic, it's not military, it's not economic. There is no rational reason for this, and this is very worrying. And it should worry decision makers in Washington, in Europe, in terms of who you're dealing with. 
The reason is because Assad crossed Erdogan. It's personal. It's about as personal as a mafia boss taking something personally. And I don't mean that in any facetious sense. And this is why the Syrian quagmire has become a huge problem for the, uh, uh, from the Turkish perspective. The two major institutions in Turkey's bureaucracy, the military and the foreign ministry, have been sidelined and looked over and passed over as significant forces which weigh in on decision making, that advises the government, the president, of what would be sensible policy openings, what would be in Turkey's national and security interests. These have been sidestepped and sidelined. If you can imagine a situation in great power play whereby the US president sidelined and didn't listen to the advice of the Joint Chiefs, the National Security Council, the State Department, the Department of Defense, to go after a personal vendetta, I think that would present a, a significant number of global problems. And some would argue that that was even done in the Bush Wars of the early 2000s. So, as a result of this policy of being crossed by Assad, Erdogan has relentlessly, from 2012, 2013 onwards, actively given support to any and every opposition group in Syria to topple the Assad regime. That includes Jabhat al-Nusra. That includes al-Qaeda. That includes the Islamic State. If you look at journalist accounts, if you look at uh, TV footage, even if you look at the tainted Turkish press, you will see how true this is. These are military, this is a military convoy in Turkey. These photos became infamous. Uh, these convoys were stopped, as you can see, by the gendarmerie in Turkey, which is a branch of the military. They supported trucks which were uh, commissioned by the National Intelligence Organization of Turkey, the MEAT. And these were inbound to Syria, and once these were stopped, searched, and seized, these trucks were found to have numerous weapons, tank shells, munitions of a large scale. And these have been, go these have been flowing across the border relentlessly, going to who knows what, or who knows who. Uh, but Western media accounts, journalists who are actually on the ground, who have filed reports to great danger of their own personal safety, are saying that these are inbound for the most nefarious groups that the US is screaming at, saying, do not aid and abet these guys. And, it's been and Turkey's pathway into Syria has been dubbed the Jihadi Highway. It's extremely volatile and dangerous in the game that Erdogan is engaging in, not only destabilizing Turkey's interests, but also Turkey's own, and Turkey's own security, but regional security. The reason why, if you ask why in that case if Turkey was supplying and arming the Islamic State, why would it bomb Turkey? Why would it carry out a bombing against Turkey subsequently in Ankara last week or a few days ago and in Suraj in July? One possible answer is so much international pressure was mounted against Erdogan and the government saying, you have to stop this. Uh, NATO, the State Department, the Defense Department started very much actively calling on Turkey to say, step up to your obligations. This is not acceptable. It's at this point that Turkey has very much stopped and uh, t reconsidered its options, which leads on to the second question and argument. Why? From the perspective of domestic politics, Erdogan is very much on a slippery slope. And this slippery slope is huge. Erdogan is clutching at straws, taking very desperate measures from a domestic standpoint of view to not only remain in politics because he's a megalomaniac, power-crazed guy. It's not the, not the overriding reason, although I don't discount that. I mean, P uh, Tony Blair would not have stepped down unless he had to. There was a certain element of narcissism and megalomania built into Tony Blair's 
uh, incumbency as prime minister, but it wasn't an existential requirement in the same way that it is for Erdogan. Erdogan needs to not only stay in power as president, but it's not enough. He also needs to have Turkey's regime transformed, ideally, from a parliamentary system where executive power will be transferred from the parliament or the cabinet to the hands of the presidency. If he could get his way, Turkey's new constitution, which would have to be changed under the description of executive powers, would ideally read, the president has all power, that's it. <laughs> without judicial oversight, without accountability, without transparency, something that may be a warped version of the Russian presidency. Because unless he does this, unless he assumes power in such a way, the fallout from this is likely to be huge. In late 2013, early 2014, Turkey was shaken by a series of corruption scandals and allegations against Erdogan, his family, the highest echelons of his party, the AKP, large swaths of the party's provincial Anatolian network, and business linkages close to the government who'd been granted unfavored public tenders. To such a large extent, and again, I don't mean this in any facetious sense, that it does make the Watergate scandal in this country look like child's play. The principle of flagrant abuse and uh, abuse of the law by numerous officials, including Erdogan, is so vast, the principle of it, in comparison to what was done at Watergate, is possibly comparable, but the scope and magnitude is incomparable. Prosecutors went out after Erdogan, the judicial branch of the country, which has since been hushed and really clamped down upon by Erdogan intimidation, so is the media, so is scholars, journalists, students, whatever you want to name it. A massive campaign has been done, uh, uh, basically pursued to cr crush this. And it was hoped that the June elections of 2015 would have allowed the AKP and Erdogan to get enough seats in parliament, a supermajority, in order to change the constitution such that Erdogan would then be free of this. He didn't get that. Forget a supermajority, the AKP does not even have a parliamentary majority. So this has resulted in desperate politics. And if you want to ask how the IS, if you want to make that linkage, and this is where I have to get speculative. I don't have hard evidence for this. But it's, it's not a, a huge stretch of the imagination. If you want to get speculative about this, since failing to get that super parliamentary majority, Turkey or Erdogan is resorting to very desperate measures. And those are two things. One, uh, it is assumed and reported that Turkey has allowed Islamic State bombings to be carried out in Turkey. It is also the reason that it is assumed that Turkey has summarily ended the peace negotiations with its Kurdish minority and actively provoked the separatist PKK organization to carry out bombings which has resulted in the Turkish military being put on high alert and active campaigns against the PKK. Why? A state of national emergency. The biggest policy opening out of this is hoped that voters will fear what's going on. National sentiments amongst Turks themselves will be very much directed against the Kurds, against uh, anyone else that is opposing Erdogan and rally to Erdogan at the polls on November 1, in less than three weeks. And that is a very, very dangerous position. It's speculative, but I'm not completely without basis. So I'll give you one example, which it's not concrete, but you make, your you make the decision for yourself. The Suraj bomber of July, he also had a brother. I'm not kidding. That brother, is one of the two bombers that blew himself up in Ankara. You think the Turkish National Intelligence Organization would not be interested in questioning 
doing a background check into who this guy was in Surich first. Where they move, you know, do they have, do they have any accomplices, any familial ties? Look at the Boston bomber. They probe the entire family back to wherever, the Stone Age. You know, every piece of stick of chewing gum they probably bought. The brother of the Surich bomber, one is one of the bombers, confirmed bombers of, 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 of Ankara. There is a list in the hands of Turkey's prime minister. They've publicly disclosed this thing. We have 21 individuals, of which one of those was on the watch list. Why wasn't this guy taken into custody? Why aren't the 21 members on that list now still not taken into custody? Davut Toldo's response on the left, who's prime minister, is saying, we can't arrest people who haven't committed a crime. You can't take people into custody and question them? I mean, Turkey's anti-terrorism laws are pretty straightforward. They're not, they don't differ that much in terms of what's on paper and the powers that it grants the police or law enforcement agencies. You make up your mind. So what does this leave us? It leaves us with three things that you can sort of ponder and hopefully ask about, maybe. What kind of an ally is Turkey and who are we making a deal with, with our, uh, as, as NATO partners? NATO is an organization, the European Union, given Erdogan and the Turkish government's priorities. Does this make him the most dangerous and most unpredictable leader that is democratically elected in the Middle East? Secondly, leading on from that, I think Turkey's dealings and policies over the Islamic State has alienated Turkey's relations with a considerable part of the world. Not least of all the Middle East, but great powers such as the Russian Federation, which you can ask about and I can elaborate upon, but also the United States. The Obama administration does not directly talk, or Obama does not directly talk with Erdogan. If someone needs to talk to Erdogan, it's Joe. It's a highly suspicious relationship that is predicated right now upon necessity, not uh, trust. And finally, a country, I think, that was projected possibly as a model, possibly as an inspiration or an example to Arab regimes transitioning out of authoritarianism in the region for a while, for a considerable amount of time, that did promise a better way of life, I think, to a certain extent, in Turkey's secular, in Turkey's socially mobile, largely inclusive uh, society model, has now been compromised by a very, very dangerous government in man. Thank you very much for your time. Sure, yeah, absolutely. That's, that'd be lovely. Thank you. So we don't have that much time. We have 10 minutes for questions. Uh, uh, so the floor is open. Um, sure. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for this elaboration. It's very interesting. Um, I, I wonder whether you could describe a little bit in how now the Russian position comes in there, and particularly the most recent bombing, how this plays out for Turkey. Maybe you Thank you. Um, I mean, I have to say, I really don't know too much about Russia myself or Russian motivations. It's what I largely re read in the press. Um, and I've missed out some of those in the last few days. But um, as I understand it, the Russians have now become very heavily involved militarily in the region uh, and actually have fighters stationed in Syria. They are carrying out bombing campaigns against rebel groups uh, who are fighting ISIS and trying also to, uh, uh, to maintain the position of Assad, which is a very sort of real politic move on the part of Putin, um, which I guess was predictable to a certain point based on understanding that the West was not gonna budge a finger when Russia took a very aggressive position against the Ukraine. In the same way, it's unlikely that anyone is gonna take a strong position, a military position against Russians, uh, uh, Russia in uh, Syria, but also from a very specific point of view of interest, as Russian interests go, Russia has a vested stake in coming into this in the way that it has done. It's not likely to engage United States or allies one way or another. It's not likely to do that. But it has a vested interest, for example, in making sure that a safe zone or a no-fly zone or whatever zone that's established in northern Syria is not set up. And Putin has very real motive. It's, it's, it's a very rational policy. 
um, the fact that Turkish warplanes and Turkish airspace have been harassed is just a show of strength saying we're committed to doing this. And it knows that Turkey is unlikely to engage, although there are rumors that a Russian jet was shot down by Turkey. It hasn't been substantiated. It's a show of real politique that basically suggests that Russia is taking care of its own interests, knowing that the United States or its partners will not engage with them militarily, most likely. That's the calculation, I guess. But not waiting around uh, to prevent certain things from coming to, to coming to being. Turkey would like to position probably all of its refugees into a safe zone and possibly uh, use, use these zones to conduct further strikes against Assad uh, and take out the regime and prevent the unification of the Kurdish areas in northern Syria, as can be seen uh, up there. Somewhere they're hoping that to place them somewhere around here. Just, you know, prevent this sort of unification from taking place. R the Russians, have, I, from my understanding and my, 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 my personal opinion, it's not necessarily the best one, I think it's a policy that's very rational and somewhat predictable because uh, no one's going to oppose them. And Russia is the only power that could probably do that. Yes? A question about the Turkish military uh, with its history of secularism yes. um, and the uh, Erdogan regime's relationship with the military, which has been disastrous and uh, extremely destructive to the military. Uh, isn't there a fear that now with uh, stepping up military security uh, as a reaction to these bombings, that the military might actually turn against Erdogan and against his regime? So since about thank you for the questions. So since about 2007, um, Turkey's military has been the subject of a number of uh, trials, some of the show trials, probably the most of them are show trials, and a considerable number of Turkey's uh, Turkish military's uh, governing capacity has been emasculated, undercut, imprisoned, to the point that they assume that Turkey might actually have an operational capacity problem should it require. Uh, deployment of troops into this area because so many of the top governing and experienced officers have been arrested and jailed. And leading on from that, people have said, well, the Turkish military is now a compliant and uh, sort of sub uh, submissive uh, force and really has gone back to its barracks, if not for entirely democratic reasons or met by, by democratic uh, methods. Um, now, all of those, a lot of, uh, nearly all of those imprisoned generals, high-ranking officers have been subsequently been released and some have even been acquitted. My answer to your question is, I don't know. But that shouldn't be taken, I don't, I don't think, as one saying, no, the military is not likely to or cannot do anything. As I said, all of these military officers have been released. Some of them are very angry. I, some of them are very vocal and write, publish and appear on TV. Um, they command a lot of respect within the military itself. The military is, inc is interestingly very silent on the ongoings of Turkey's domestic politics uh, and the reactions against Erdogan. We do know they're extremely critical of certain policies. One, they're extremely critical or were extremely critical of the Kurdish opening. They were not consulted. They are not happy about this. Um, I would not put anything past the Turkish military. Uh, I would go as far as saying if we woke up in some, some time from here on in to, to turn on to the news that there was a coup d'etat has taken place, I would not be surprised. I don't advocate for this. I don't wish this. But it's not beyond the realm of possibility after, uh, after where Turkey is heading now. Um, I think if, you know, why, why wait or why, why are they still sitting around? From the perspective of creating a zone of or an image of legitimacy, the Turkish military has historically been a very patient one and requiring national and security conditions to get so out of control, saying that there was no other out, no other option but for a military intervention. We saw this in the last coup, 1980 coup, uh, whereby warnings were given to the Turkish civilian leaders nine months ahead of the coup d'etat. Right now, we have elections scheduled for November 1. There is an electoral process. There are seeming avenues whereby a process and the institutions of democracy will likely be given a chance to, to work. Um, but there are international crises. Um, if that j Russian jet shot down by Turkey supposedly is confirmed, for example, or if something like that happens again, 
uh, if NATO is called into uh, to conference, if there are further bomb explosions by Islamic State in Turkey, if the Turkish military ac actively engages more with the Kurdish uh, separatist fighters, if there is a massive rebellion resulting in election monitoring and election ballot boxes being curtailed in certain parts of the country, and that results in an uprising, if security conditions deteriorate, and all of these are within the realms of possibility, in my opinion, these days. The most seasoned analysts of Turkey, I think, who are infinitely more wiser and experienced than I am, they're on the record for saying, we are in uncharted territory as far as where Turkey is going now. I wouldn't put anything beyond the realm of possibility. Yes, sir. Uh, what is the uh, prognosis right now for the election results? Um, again, I don't know. Uh, and I, it, the last election in June, there was widespread fear that the government would uh, rig it or get significantly involved to the extent that it would really um, get what it wants. It didn't. It's a hard thing to do. You have election monitors. Every ballot box has election monitors from every single political party. You, you have the right to do that. As an independent observer, you don't even have to be affiliated with it. You can just sign up to be an independent election monitor to, to help count the vote process, to oversee um, how votes are being placed. And you, know, it, you have international monitors. Every, after the votes are counted, you fill out the form. People take photos with their smartphones, uh, smartphones and they, they check to see the data that was written onto this piece of paper is the one that was uploaded onto the server, which has then gone, gone to the Higher Electoral Council in Ankara. It's hard to do. Now, I'm not saying it hasn't happened, but if they could have done that, why, are they, why didn't they do that in June of 2015? Um, other tactics that they, they could employ is, they've tried this already, they, the, the government said they petitioned the High Electoral Council to basically not hold elections in certain precincts, mainly in Kurdish towns, because they fear, well, they're not fear, it's a foregone conclusion. I don't think there's a single Kurd who can see and write and hear that's going to vote for the, for the AKP. That wasn't true before. Um, but the Higher Electoral Council overruled that decision, saying that's not going to happen. Other things that could happen on election day, what if you have a, pro, uh, uh, let's say you have people, ca uh, you know, the votes, are being pla uh, the votes are being placed and the polls are closed. In the process of counting, there's a provocation within an electoral precinct whereby some person, you don't know who they are, they start screaming, they start, they start a fight, and it gets, a commotion starts up, and the police have to come in and clear out the room. That's not hard to do. And then nobody's kept in in, in, the, in the process of counting votes. And then whatever's uploaded is uploaded. Um, what if, this is all speculation, I mean, but not outside the realms, I mean, given what the government's engaged in so flagrantly, what if prior to the elections we see more type Ankara and Suraj type attacks such that Erdogan says when we don't have a stable situation where we can guarantee the lives of voters so elections are curtailed and I'm assuming emergency powers as directed by the constitution? I don't know. Um, what if they try and rig it? I, I, I have no idea. Let's go. Um, uh, is there any other question? Uh, maybe you should go because we're running out of time. So please go ahead. Um, you mentioned a personal vendetta of Erdogan's against the Saab regime that might be the primary motivation of the dating um, some other groups. Do you have an idea what that might be or where it has been mentioned or it was it speculation? Oh, no, no, that's, that's, there's, there's a huge paper trail and media trail. It, the most credible evidence comes from media uh, 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 correspondence of newspapers, TV stations in the region displaying openly on print media, broadcast media, social media, saying, look at what the Turks are giving to these rebel groups. And the reason, do you know these weapons are Turkish? Because on most of those shells, guns, munitions, there is the kite mark of the Turkish state arms manufacturer. You can trace serial codes. It's, that's not speculation, that's fact. The government would not confirm that. They, they will try and cramp, crack down on a lot of journalists and whatever, but that's an easily traceable process. And it very much plays out on a daily basis. But they, they've had to stop that. Maybe you can take Karim's question. Karim, yeah. Thanks. So I think um, it's, a, it's more like a commentary than a question. 
Uh, but there's a certain type of uh, storytelling about what's going on, you know, a certain type of myth making happening. Um, for instance, um, you mentioned in your first point the flip flop policy of, of Turkey and you know, Turkish support as well as Gulf support, particularly in South Sure, Korea, sure. Yeah. To ISIS and then they, you know, the whole situation changed. Uh, but isn't that the, you know, quite, isn't there a quite uh, similar case to be made about the US in terms of? Yes. Arming supposedly non radical um, Syrian opposition sure. because all those weapons also ended up in the hands of ISIS. And uh, Patrick, uh, I can't refer to the, say, uh, to the passage I'm not Patrick, Patrick Cooper very convincingly reports that. So, um, the same, and you know, uh, I just read an article in Foreign Policy, and it's like, uh, again, the option was to arm. Uh, pro-democracy, free Syrian army, Iraq, and like, so how would you see that? How would yeah, you, I totally agree with that. that. I mean, yes, I mean, I'm not... Yeah, I, d I chose particularly not to focus on, you know, the U.S. sort of, the U.S. perspective, but you're absolutely, I've, I agree 100% on that. You know, this whole, po this whole point about, you know, who are we arming and, uh, and you know, who, who are these weapons going to? And this, you know, moderate rebels, I mean, I, I always joked about this. Do you judge moderateness on the, on, the, on the length of their beard or the shape of their beard? I mean, how the hell can you tell? Who are these people? And it's the same problem that I think people are crying out about. Is, you know, when we started arming rebels uh, uh, in Afghanistan, you know, two and a half decades ago, or more, sorry, uh, in the 80s. It's a highly dangerous situation. And these, hands, these weapons are ending up in the hands of some really nefarious people. And we saw that. That's how the Islamic State has gotten a lot of these weapons. So, sorry, very recently, the same discourse started about arming the Kurdish rebels in the north of Turkey, although I sympathize with the peace process in Turkey. Uh, international uh, uh, Amnesty Organization just, just two days ago launched a report uh, again illustrating the war crimes and crimes against humanity. Sure. And this is a position that the Turkish government has basically said, you know, to, to detractors and the US government too, you know, waving their fingers at the administration here and saying, you're a part of this, you, you helped this. I mean, we're not the only ones that, do, that are doing this. You're also aiding and abetting some nefarious groups, and the US is saying, well, no, it's not the same thing. And I would actually say it's not the same thing as Turkey. I mean, it's it's a point of it's a it, it is a comparison and um, it's an issue of scope there, but in terms of intentions, I think um, I tend to trust the Erdogan uh, government and, 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 and intentions less so than that of the U.S. government. I think the U.S. government is in a, is in an impossible situation where um, it's beleaguered by a number of factors that is preventing more decisive and clearly thought action. Um, but I do take the, those points, yes. Um, we have one minute left, and I'm going to be selfish enough to actually ask the That's not selfish. Question. Selfish would have been first, and stuff, yeah. Um, uh, so, in the past, we actually, of oh, week and a half uh, now, um, everyone has been engaged, uh, specifically him himself, has been engaged with uh, negotiations with the EU uh, about the refugees and how, what they would, how he would hold back the refugees actually stop the boats from crossing over into Greece and so on in return for economic or other uh, uh, benefits. How does this fit into this picture that we're talking about? How do the refugees and, and Turkey actually assuming the, the role of policing the border fit into, into what you just talked about? I, th yeah, thank you. Um, I think, I think, well, I think the European Union's idea is this. You keep them. Don't come, no, don't let them come here. Turkey is not in a position, even if it wanted to, preventing people coming across the border. The borders are so porous. And this is what one of my you know, age-old arguments. If Turkey ever becomes a member of the European Union, it would never become a member of the Schengen area. Turkey cannot, you cannot patrol Turkey's borders in terms of um, uh, people that are able to cross over in a variety of ways. It's like the Mexican-US border. Even Syria and Iraq, Iraq more so, um, very porous borders. So the EU's idea is like, well, okay, they're going to come. We don't care about that necessarily. Just keep them in Turkey. And Merkel even dangled the carrot of saying we we might even like you know give a boost to the accession process. And like that. Yeah, that kind of that's just kind of not you know it's it's not genuine. Uh, that I think that's that's one aspect of it. Um, economic assistance possibly once more so. There is even possibly the uh, thought that Turkey may actually in, have to end up getting double what it has now in terms of refugee flows if the situation gets worse. But Erdogan's idea, and most sort of Arab public opinions are sympathetic to Turkey on this, to the Erdogan regime, 
because of its sort of seemingly welcoming refugee policy um, to a point. But Erdogan's policy of the refugees in Turkey has never been one predicated upon open arms, humanitarian assistance. That it was intended, I think, not I think, but this is a major argument that was put forward. The refugees in Turkey was an attempt by the Erdogan government initially to help engender a positive attitude towards Turkey, a Sunni attitude, a positive Sunni attitude to Turkey once Assad had fallen of a friendly population being dispersed and distributed back to uh, uh, Syria that would be to, uh, uh, to Turkey's liking. More so recently, they've even thought that the creation of a safe zone for the refugees, because apparently Turkey can't get any, take in more, it's a legitimate point, it's, it's, we can't take in more refugees, let's establish a safe zone where they can be monitored and protected as, we much, as very much the Kurds were in Gulf War I. But the sinister idea behind that is they want to prevent Turkey has an active interest in making sure that uh, there is no Kurdish entity that's analogous to the KRG being formed in northern Syria. So you disperse, uh, you know, you, you, you set up camps and an entity in northern Syria which prevents Kurdish unity. Thank you very much for this time. Thank you for having me.